Grimfest TV is a fantastic platform to watch the work of exceptional filmmakers in the horror industry. Whilst we're very excited to see these films, we are at least equally excited to meet the people behind these productions. So let's see if uh, we can get a hold of someone. Ah, yes, the Grimfest basement. What have we here? Ooh, Loom, this looks fun. Kevin Roethlisberger, director of Loom, hello. Hello, Miriam, my love, how are you? Brock Russell, producer of Loom, why hello. Hey Miriam, how you doing? Hope all is well. David Christopher Pitt, DP of Loom, is that you? Miriam, hello, how are you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about Loom? Loom is a uh, throwback 1978 Wolfman film. Um, it's done in the style of uh, some of Carpenter's best work in the late 70s, early 80s. Same with a kind of a Spielbergian vibe of his late, late 70s, early 80s work. It's a little bit of a Toby Hooper vibe in there. Um, that's what we are going for on this one. But it, yeah, it's very EC comic and it's just a blast. Very aware of itself. but. Um, we put a lot of reverence in it. So we, we hope you guys enjoy it if you watch it. Now, I can't quite put my finger on it, but what is it that makes Loom so special? It's definitely the actors. And I, I know I'm in it. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about all the other actors as well. That the, the actors I got for this hit their note perfectly. They, they, they knew what genre they were in. They knew that the everything was campy and cliche, but yet they didn't play a meta performance. They committed to the story and to their characters while playing the genre. And that they, I, I, I can't stress how important it was that, that they hit their notes so perfectly and it sells the film. That, and the second thing is, we didn't just dress everybody in 1978 garbs and get the right truck and get the right pants and the right hair, the haircut. That's part of it. What we created was a vibe. You know, you heard people like, ooh, that's a vibe. You know, we really mean that. But we created an atmosphere and a tone and a vibe that is actually visceral. You really do feel like you're in 1978 and we let that just be. We don't try to call it out. It's just 1978, and it, and for someone who's never even been born during that time, wasn't never experienced it. I watch it, and even I'm like, wow, I really feel like I'm, I'm in 1978. I can't explain it. There's something very atmospheric and visceral about when you watch it. You're actually transported there. And as I'm not even trying to be biased on that. I really think those are the two things I'm most proud of. I could go a million things. Oh, this, this, that, 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 that. But I think those are the two things that make it special, watchworthy. What I think makes Loom special is the fact that we really tried to make this feel like a lost film from the late 70s, whether that was mono roars from The Wolfman or to feel like 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, or just restrict ourselves to the equipment we could use to try and feel like we were actually shooting this in this time period. We shot on lenses that were around in the 70s and popular in the 70s. We shot with a lot of tungsten lamps. Of course, we did have to use things like sky panels or LEDs to speed things up, but we tried to really restrict ourselves so this feels the most authentic it possibly can. Question. What makes a good Wolfman movie. The way we approached Loom in regards to the Wolfman aspect is to always keep it about the internal struggle that, in this case, Adam, our protagonist, is, is struggling with. At the beginning of the story, he's a very innocent man. He is very all-American, Americana, um, charming, young man, but at the beginning of it, he doesn't even want to have sex because he feels like that him and his girlfriend aren't ready. And assuming that they've been together for some time. Um, 
and then seeing that juxtaposed with and contrasted with the transformation of this of this young man into a killer wolf man and lashing out maybe all these maybe feelings that he's bottled up inside and releasing them in this moment of rage and fear and anger we found that the internal struggle that one faces every day um, whether it be that the demons that you face the demons that or inside of you that you don't want to release. And, um, and the, the hard questions you don't want to answer. Um, and having those come to the surface in the worst way possible. In this case, a killer wolf man is something that we found to be the most interesting aspect and something that we didn't want to forget about, even though it is a fun popcorn movie and there are fun preacher designs and what have you. Um, that's not something that we don't want to forget about is that at the end of the day, this is an innocent man who is placed with this ultimate curse that he's now going to have to live with and struggle with, just like we all struggle with demons. We aren't, um, killer beasts on the outside when those demons come to the surface. But, um, I can't relate to being a wolf man, but I can relate to having, um, regrets and secrets and demons that I live with, just like we all do. And um, so having those demons manifested into something fun can be cathartic, but also entertaining. But hopefully at the same time, uh, you're able to relate to. Ooh, this is starting to sound exciting. I could really go with a teaser right now. generally sold, but how about the good stuff? Give me some fun facts. Fun fact. So the guy who actually pulled the molds for the loom prosthetics, facial prosthetics, he actually worked on some trauma films back in the uh, late 80s. Fun fact. Kevin had these gigantic sideburns for the, for the movie, and whenever he put on his prosthetics, they would still kind of puff out. And he just was this wolf man with these giant burns and and he kind of had this swagger when he walked, so he earned the nickname, The Disco Wolf. Fun fact, Loom was actually sound designed at Skywalker Ranch, which was one of the greatest moments of my life. Fun fact, we had old beer cans, authentic 1970s old beer cans on set. So after unsuccessfully speaking to some, uh, some beer companies that existed in the 70s they are still around today, we finally found Brain Belt Beer in Minnesota, and they were nice enough to loan some old beer cans, um, ones that had been drained from the bottom, but the pull tab, the old vintage 1970s pull tab was still intact. So that was really important to us because we wanted that authenticity. So what we did is we took a non-alcoholic beer that we purchased at the market and cut off the top and then cut off the bottom of these real thick steel 70s cans and then pretty much slid it on top almost like a like a shield and so you were able to pull the tab and drink and we wanted the frothiness that's why we use the non-alcoholic beer we use non-alcoholic beer because we wanted to make it hell for our actors and so uh basically we got the effects and we got the pull tab in there we had multiple to use for different takes so yeah Brain Belt Beer in Minnesota, they saved our asses. Fun fact, the contacts that we actually got for the Wolfman were actually made from the same company and designers for uh, Michael Jackson's thriller, The Cat Eyes. Fun fact, when Brock drove our car into a ravine, he calls Kevin, tells him he has this horrible news. Kevin thinks that someone on the crew has died. It turns out we just had to get towed back up. But this was the first time Kevin was ever in full prosthetics. So no one had seen him yet. 
So the first time our director is in full prosthetics, he is chewing out Brock. And it's the funniest thing in the world because Brock is like trying to keep a straight face, but he's got this wolf man just yelling at him and telling him how, uh, how ridiculous and childish he is for what he did. Fun fact, the last day of filming, we ran out of money, which no one knew. And my associate producer came to me saying, we only have $140 left in our budget. So I told her to go to Walmart and buy about five Stouffer top lasagnas. And it was actually everyone's favorite meal that night. And we thought that was really funny because they had no idea we had no money. But it worked. Fun fact. Fun fact. Kevin Roethlisberger, the director and star of Loon, did his own stunts on set. He jumped off the back of a moving truck going 40 miles an hour. And then somehow <laughs> he did it twice. So Kevin is hanging on the back of the truck. The shot is supposed to be Kevin falling off the back of the truck. And the truck keeps speeding up and speeding up. Kevin's not jumping. Kevin's not jumping. And I'm like, oh, shit. Kevin, you got to jump. <laughs> and we're up to like 35, 40 miles an hour. And Kevin jumps off and then tucks and rolls and was able to walk off into the cornfield. And we got the shot. And he said, let's do it again, just for safety. So he did it twice. Getting hit by a truck, we faked that, of course. But like, if you're a wolf man, you get hit by a truck, it's going to hurt. Especially the next morning when you're in human form. So at the end of the movie, when Kevin's limping through the cornfield and the campsite, that limp was real. Now, as we're putting together the edit, um, we realized that we needed a quick little insert shot of the Wolfman flying over the top of the truck. So like six or seven months later, I'm in Kevin's backyard and I am in wolf prosthetic. They've put it on me now and I'm wearing his outfit from the film. And so I'm trying to tuck and roll onto the mattresses and we do it several times. So if you go back and uh, freeze frame the probably tw the like, one second shot of the Wolfman flying over, that's me. And then also look for Kevin doing his own stunts uh, because he's a stud and he gets what he needs. So what would you say has Loom taught you about good filmmaking? The biggest takeaway with Loom is it sort of pushed all of us to reach to a higher level of professionalism. For Loom, we were just a couple independent dudes. Yes, we had money and we had a big crew, but this was the first time we had ever reached out to anyone, like for example, Skywalker Sound and then Company 3 and all these bigger companies that we found out were attainable for independent filmmakers to actually reach out to and collaborate with. And ever since then, it's been one of those things that as filmmakers, we're constantly striving to get these people and collaborate with people who are better than us, who can expand our knowledge and overall make our projects better. Loom has taught me that good filmmaking is about collaboration and trusting the people that you've brought together on set and for the project in general. To trust the ship that sailed you in, but also to trust your vision. Don't let go of your vision, but you have to collaborate. And if something goes wrong, you really do have to know how to creatively pivot. And that should actually be something I've learned for me. Good filmmaking is when you thrive on that. When you actually get excited that something is screwing up and it isn't 100% the way you want it. And you have to make an equally quick decision, a, a decision that's quick enough but equally powerful than the thing that you just had to scrap. And that's called pivoting, and that's being what I think a good filmmaker is, especially in directing. But you have to, you can't do that without collaborating, listening to other people, hearing their, their input, and then filtering it through and making sure that it does not jeopardize the vision and the flow and the, the, the meter and everything. As always, it has been a pleasure talking to you guys. And for you at home, if you want to see Loom, Go online to GrimFest TV and watch it for yourself. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Enjoy. So long, Miriam. Take care. Jeez.
That was fun. Yeah.